Pasca. Oh, shoot. Oh, uh oh. oh. Triple. And we're going in. Good afternoon, everyone that's coming in online. We've got a few participants coming in right now. We have a lot of people registered for today, so I'm really excited about um, our discussion. And we've got some amazing people with us online today and people that you know and some people that you don't know. So that's part of you know, being able to have these conversations and, and bring new people into the yarn. But before we go too much further, it is really important. I'm um, acutely aware that I am not from this country. I'm an Eastern Islander woman and I am living and playing and working on Ghana country. And I am most privileged to do that. And I'm most privileged to raise my children on this country and feel extremely honored to do so. So I would like to pay my respects to Ghana. I'd like to pay um, my respects to elders past and present. Also I'd like to pay my respects to um, you know, the young ones coming up who are gonna lead us and me um, into the future. I'd also like to pay my respects to people online today. We have some amazing people that are joining us um, and giving their time to talk about this really interesting topic, but also um, some amazing um, thoughts and experience we have on the line here that you all get to learn today. Um, so if I can um, ask you know, our panelists today, I'll, I'll, I'll probably throw to you because you know, formatting and handling um, you know, Zoom calls is always difficult. Um, if you could just do a quick introduction as to who you are, where you're from, um, even if you want to tell us what country you're born on, that's wonderful. But we're really keen to know who you are and why you find yourself on the screen today so um, people kind of understand your place in this space. So we might start off, if you don't mind, um, maybe Keenan, are you able to introduce yourself and, and give us a bit of an understanding about why you're here today? Yeah. Awesome. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Great. Um, so before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the country that I'm um, zooming in on from today, of the Ghana people, and acknowledge um, the elders past, present and emerging, and also acknowledge the sovereignty never ceded. Um, so my name is Keenan. I'm a Gugudu, Murning and Wurrungal person from the far west coast of South Australia. I'm based now on Ghana country here in Adelaide, um, where I'm undertaking and almost finished my environmental sciences degree here at Flinders. Um, I've been involved with the Uluru Youth Dialogue Groups for the last, I think, maybe over a year now. Um, I'm very passionate about social justice for First Nations people. Um, um, yeah, and also really excited as a young person to be getting involved in, um, in st stuff like the Uluru Statement, because I think it's stuff that often is dismissed um, on a national platform, and so was the Uluru Statement when it was first introduced. Um, and I think it's great to see that it's often pushed by grassroots movements. That's where a lot of success comes from as well. But I'll leave that, that sorry. That's all right, Keenan. We'll um, we'll get into that because I, you know, am oh. a big believer in that can as you well. Can hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. I think your screen's just frozen, but that'll be okay. Yeah, we can hear you, Keenan. That's oh. fine. Yeah, no worries. Um, and um, Sky, are you able to, you know, give us a bit of a lead-in for you? Hi, Sky. Oh, me. Oh, sorry. Did you say, sorry, I missed that. Um, sorry, that was me. That's what right. I probably missed. <laughs> thank you, Sean, for the introduction and for inviting me to, to be here today. Um, I would like to acknowledge that I'm currently sitting on Ghana land, which is where I work. Uh, I grew up on in the mid-north of South Australia, um, at Hallett, which is Nudgery country. And I live on, in the Adelaide Hills near Strathalbyn on Paramount country. So um, work, live, grew up in completely different places. But yes, I would also like to acknowledge the elders of all of those places and the future, future leaders too, and that each of those places, of course, like all of Australia, was unseated by the um, Aboriginal owners of those places at the time of colonisation. Um, I am here because I'm currently working on a project at the University, well, uh, hosted by the University of Adelaide called Reconciling with the Frontier. And we are mapping um, all as many accounts of conflict between settlers and Aboriginal people in the colonial era as we can, but I'll talk about that later. But a large component of this um, is hearing stories from Aboriginal people themselves and, and um, respecting those stories and giving a, a large platform to those stories. So I'm a research fellow at the University of Adelaide and I've been working on Aboriginal settler history for the last 20 years, I guess. 
Thank you. Thank you, Sky. And I might throw, um, Sally, we'll come to you last. Um, sorry, you know, because, you know, I always bounce off Sally in these webinars. Uh, but I might throw to um, Professor Alex Riley. You have to give us a bit of a um, rundown on who you are and what you're doing on our screen today. Absolutely. Thanks for inviting me today. So um, I'm on Ghana country and I'm born and raised on Ghana country and my children were born on Ghana country as well. So I'm very grateful to the Ghana people for allowing me to do that. And I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, so I've been involved in uh, researching in various sort of legal issues in relation to Aboriginal peoples. Um, so certainly around social justice, criminal justice, particularly in native title. So I did quite a bit of work researching native title in the 1990s and early 2000s. Um, I'm a constitutional lawyer by background. So I'm absolutely so impressed by the, the voice movement, um, the, the grassroots way that that's been achieved. And the, the brilliant concept that uh, uh, people came up with for changing the constitution. We've been talking about constitutional change to better represent Aboriginal people for so many years and got ourselves tied in knots. And then you just come up with the perfect, the, the perfect constitutional change. So uh, I feel very passionate about wanting that to happen because I think it's so, so vital. Thanks, Alex. Absolutely. And a most gracious invitation um, that accompanied it as well. Um, Sally, uh, I know you're a regular on the show, um, but there are some new new attendees today. I was just wondering if you can give a bit of a rundown around you and your place in this space. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm here always because Shona wants to bounce off me, as she said. Um, no, so I would also, I'm a Pidanjara woman from um, the APY lands. I'm from a place called Bibliata, which is nestled right on the WA border. Um, I've been involved with the Uluru Statement before it became the Uluru Statement. I was fortunate enough to go to the dialogues, one in Ross River and forced and begged to come to the Adelaide one because while I'm the APY lands are in South Australia, it's very much also in Central Australia. So the differences as well was really incredible to see the conversations that happened. Um, since the Uluru Statement um, and the Uluru Convention happened, I've been involved with the national team in that leadership space, working on getting, getting the Uluru Statement out there to the Australian people and making sure that they don't forget that it was actually gifted to them um, and not just to the government. Um, so I would also like to acknowledge the incredible Ghana people for the lands that I, because I'm also here in Adelaide. Um, but I also want to acknowledge my leaders and my incredible um, elders that have paved the incredible pathways for me to even be in this space and who, you know, and our resistance uh, leaders across this country years for, um, any sort of recognition. Uh, we often think about the Uluru Statement being only four years, but we forget that the truth in that matter is that we've been asking for a form of treaty, a form of recognition for centuries. And, you know, that's a conversation we truly need to have. Thank you, Sally. And um, I appreciate and, and I'm most thankful for everyone um, coming from very different, very different headsets today. So it's going to be a wonderful conversation. And we have had um, a few webinars before. Um, we had one around um, voice and exploring that, unpacking that a little bit. We've had a webinar around treaty and we unpacked that last week. And this week, obviously, our focus is on the third element that is really important that uh, we were, you know, clearly given some guidance on from the Uluru do um, Dialogue, which, you know, and the statement itself was around truth. And look, if you're wanting to um, see those webinars, feel free to check it out. Um, I'll put a link in the chat line later. Um, let's get into a conversation about truth now. We've only got an hour to go here and, and we've done, um, you know, a really, it's a big topic to explore because it's got multiple facets to it. But I'm going to throw firstly probably to um, what I think is um, pretty critical is um, Sally and Keenan. Um, if I can throw to you both first, so heads up. Um, I'm really keen to get an understanding around uh, why truth came up. Um, as one of those really standout items that we needed to look at in Australia. Why was it that truth got picked out in the top three of those big conversation pieces um, at the regional dialogues and again um, at the Uluru Convention in May 2017? And in the youth dialogues as well, sorry, 
Keenan, it popped up there as well. <laughs> um, I can go first. So with the dialogue sort of stuff, the um, the way that it happened, so the very much the core um, was around that voice and around that hopelessness. And, you know, we know how many organisations have been started for mob, like ATSIC and stuff like that, and, the you know, the rug being pulled out of it. Um, you know, those advisory councils and such. And so, and also treaties always been a big conversation for us as well. And one of the elements when we're talking about, you know, that process and what's happened and particularly around the voice element is everyone talked about our own history and about where as, a, as First Nations people of this country, constantly the lens that we look on Australian history and also First Nations history, we've never been a part of that conversation. It's very narrow. It's very um, through a white lens. Um, and, you know, the victors do get to write their own stories. And so a lot of them were like, well, we want to talk and teach about our laws, you know, our stories, you know, the varying different nations that we have, the, the resistance that we've had, our you know, our own stories about invasion and what that looked like, you know, and the fact that, you know, Cook discovered us, but it's like, no, 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 we were here. Well, he saw us, but we were here. Um, and all of those, and so it was a really, it was a, a natural progression that the voice came through because it, everyone was like, we want to tell our own story. And I think, you know, the it really speaks to that element of why voice voice treaty truth happen in that sequence you know we want to have a voice to be at the table to discuss what we want to discuss we want to be at that table to talk about treaty and the negotiations around that we then want to be at that table to tell our stories of the truth of our country so that everyone has a better understanding of it because while here in South Australia we might learn about Maralinga and the devastation and the Emu Junction happened people in other states don't know that. And so it's like, how do we share that story without a third party, without someone else taking the credit and let that story be shared in a really holistic way. And I think that was, I think that's the best way I can explain <laughs> how the truth came about because it's, but also shown in our, it's our nature to be wanting to tell a story. It's our nature, you know, Aboriginal people are oral histories, but we also put, you know, we've got the beautiful sand drawings, we've got beautiful cave drawings where we were telling and passing on that knowledge and we want that to be shared. We want Australians to be, hear more about our own history. There's every nation has different incredible stories of good and bad of our history. Absolutely. Thank you, Sally. And I mean, we have had something pop up um, on our questions in our Q and A around um, the sequencing. And I think, um, you know, I think the question is, um, you know, obviously Uluru had voice treaty truth in there. Does it have to be done in an order, or can truth be used to get to the other two? And I think, you know, you kind of answered it. But Keenan, did you want to explore that a little bit more? Or, um, the Sally, Sally can if you wanted to do that too, I'm fine. Um, but I'm acutely aware that, um, you know, in the truth space, our, um, you know, a lot of that happens in our education institutions with our kids. Um, I know I grew up um, being an only Aboriginal kid in the class and, um, you know, feeling quite ashamed of um, who my mob were, where we were from. Can you explore that a little bit more around the youth conversations around truth and the importance of that? Um, I'll just add on quickly to what Sally was saying, um, but also there's been no formal truth telling process in Australia, like period. I know Victoria um, last year, I think the government agreed to a, a truth commission or something, and that's, yeah, and they're exploring that. Um, because of the Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander people, um, we live with our truths and we live with the trauma and the hurt and the pain with all those truths. Where I'm from, we have a massacre site. And for years we've known, we've had heard all the stories. Every family had their own story of that site. And it wasn't until I think a year or two ago where we actually got a memorial, but that even took years to, to, get, that, to get that done and to get that put in place and to get that agreed by both First Nation and non-First Nation parties. Because also 
not only are you dealing with our truth, but then you're dealing with conflicting accounts of history by historians, um, which has always been an ongoing um, battle for First Nations people in Australia, especially in the 90s with the history war. Um, so, and I think because we haven't had any kind of, because you look at the countries that have gone through periods of genocide and conflict and colonization and invasion, um, countries have had gone through truth telling like processes and, and or, the, or the conditions or whatever, whatever they phrase them as, where we haven't. So then you get these new generations of non-First Nations people that don't know nothing. And then you're getting us more that are coming through again, that are having those stories. And then you're having the same arguments every generation. There's nothing really put in place to kind of educate and raise awareness to non-First Nations people around our shared histories, because the burden shouldn't just be on us to have this, um, this trauma being carried on or this burden. Like, I think in order for us to actually move forward and to actually heal, especially us as First Nations people, like we, we need to share these stories. We need to, we need to share this trauma and this hurt and let these, I shouldn't say white followers, but there's no First Nations mob know that like, even like they say, get on, move over, get on, get over it, move on, you know, and it's like, well, how can we when we inherit this and when our communities are still in this state of like hurt and shock because nothing's been done, you know? Um, I work in the school space as well as a mentor and I see all the students and and for a lot of the history topics, they learn more about civil rights movements in, a, in America than they do in Australia. And they get wild and they get angry. They're like, well, how come not learning about our stuff? And I'm like, well, I'm not, I can't change the curriculum, but you can like angle in aspects of our history into that. You know, like I try to get them to incorporate any kind of history that, that they can into their assignments so that they're at least sharing a bit of their truth. I don't know, but it's, it's an interesting space. Absolutely. And I might, oh, sorry, Sally. I will just add on to Keenan's little thing. And this goes into that element of the truth telling. And I'm just going to be super quick. So with that ed education component saying, you know, we need to tell more of our history, I would also say, well, in that ed education department, have they employed any First Nations teachers and educators to work on the Australian curriculum? So that's the voice element in that. So, you know, it's all well and good to tell that story. But again, on, on whose lens are you telling that story? Yep. If you don't have the First Nations voice at that top end to talk about it, to go through it, to make sure that that, that story is those in that Australian curriculum, whether it's for university students, schools, primary or, you know, secondary, you need to have people there going through that Australian curriculum to ensure that it's done in a correct manner. So, and it's not generalised so that we can have that. That's the voice element. Yeah. Um, I might throw um, to you, Alex, if that's okay. Um, you know, we, we talked about, Sally referenced before, you know, the kind of the sequencing um, of the statement and the importance for voice before, you know, you have the voice and then you need to sit at the table and then you need to have the conversation around this really immense, immensely big piece of piece of conversation we need to have as a country. Um, you know, can you, you know, as a constitutional lawyer and someone who's worked in the native title space for a very long time, can you tell us why that is so important that there is a kind of, there is a flow to this that, that makes sense and for good reason? Yeah, thanks. Um, I mean, I, I was just wrote down on my pad of paper, truth can only emerge from voice. You can't have truth unless you are at the table, as, as Sally said. I mean, truth is controlled by the powerful. We, we know that through who, who's got the biggest social media presence and things like that. And the whole Donald Trump era, it's like, who, who's creating truth? So, of course, we don't want false truth. But if you're, if you're going to be in the truth game, you have to have a voice at the table. And I think Native Title is a really interesting example, I think, from my research of a process that was about trying to deliver a new truth. So we, we had this idea of native title that the High Court created. What happened after that was that they created legislation. Who created the legislation? Australian Parliament. How many Aboriginal people were there? Might have been one in the Parliament at the time. They had advisors. We had really important people like Mick Dodson, Lewitcher O'Donoghue, who were advising them, but they weren't at the table creating native title legislation. The native title legislation, so native title and all the claims process created 
remarkable new knowledge of the past. There were historians involved, anthropologists, Aboriginal people bravely got up and told their stories about their connection to land, which was the basis of a claim. But because the process wasn't controlled by Aboriginal people at all, it was focused on determining whether Aboriginal people were able to make out a land rights claim. And in fact, often it was used to say, well, sorry, you've lost your connection to country. You don't get your native title. So when you don't have control of a process, you can end up the, of a process of trying to come to the truth. It can be used in ways that, that are really unfortunate. And so I think having that voice in the constitution gives a, a stronger chance or the, the chance to go, hang on, we need to be able to control how our truths are told, not through some sort of white man's process to determine land rights. There was some great stuff that came out of native title, no doubt, but it also was uncontrolled by Aboriginal people and it led to a lot of damage. Yeah, thank you, Alex. And I suppose um, if we go over to Sky, um, over because my screen has you over on my left hand side. Um, if we can go to you, Sky, um, you know, there is, um, you're in the middle of this right now um, and, and doing some research in South Australia. You have to just um, share with the team uh, online here today around what, what you're doing and how, you know, you know, this piece of work you're doing is um, engaging First Nations communities in that process um, and, you know, enabling that voice and that storytelling from that place. Yep. Thanks, Shona. Um, yeah, really interesting to hear what you've said, Sally and Keenan. Um, and hopefully, you know, what our, what our project is doing is answering some of those, you know, trying to incorporate exactly what you've said. So the project is called Reconciling with the Frontier. Uh, it's, it's trying to track, as I said, all incidents of violence that occurred in South Australia. Um, my, many of you might have heard of the massacre map, the Newcastle massacre map, which has as a definition six people who were, you know, were murdered, killed. We, uh, we don't have it, we're looking at any, it could be one person, it could be a massacre, it could be a large number of people, it might not be that anyone died, but people were injured, or it might be a confrontation, it might be rape, it might be um, police, uh, deaths in police custody, um, witness treatment, and people dying of, you know, when they appeared as witnesses and, and weren't treated um, well. So we're trying to capture as many, many incidents of violence as we can. And there's two components to it. One is the archival component, which is all the um, historical records, police records, government correspondence, newspaper reports, reminiscences, diaries, which, as you are well aware, are stemming from one cultural group, the white colonists. The, um, but even in that, there is the archives are packed with stories of violence. So. It's going to be, I think, really useful for the broad community to hear all these incidents of violence that are in the archival record. But the second component of the project is the oral history component, and it's equally important. In fact, it built into our project is the imperative to work with Aboriginal communities on telling their stories if they want those stories told um, and consulting with them about what we found from the archival record and what their and, and recording as many stories from different different groups. Um, it might be an individual family story, it might be the broader community story, um, might be all centered around place, it might be a more general story of, of death and uh, disease, but to to include them equally, not not as a hierarchy, not that you know one version is more true than another version, but to equally um, present those stories and to have with the archival records, we want to have the actual archival record. People can click on that and they can read that themselves with the Aboriginal stories and I should say settler descendant oral histories as well. Um, if the if the um, person that we interviewed wants is happy for their voice to be heard, but for, for people to hear people telling those stories through an audio, you know, audio recording or video, if people are happy with that as well. Um, and we have this, we in fact did into our project was an Aboriginal reference group and it wasn't an advisory off the side, but a key component to um, us working out the process of how we can best include 
Aboriginal stories really integrated into this um, this project. But we, we're at the stage we and um, the reference group is advising us how to best consult with a broader community, um, which we are at the at that point now. Yeah, Excellent. and it is quite uh, you know, and it's not easy. Um, I, you know, we we work with Sky on this piece of work, and, and it, it's you know, I think there's a question that came up. It's called reconciling with the frontier. Yes. Yep. Sky and look, it's a um, Australian research grant, and and it's happening. But it is quite a complicated, you know, it's complicated. It's a hard it's gig. There are lots of people to think about, um, and it's uh, you know, there's lots of voices that need to be considered, lots of protocols that need to be undertaken, um, yep. and that's um, a really uh, it's been an interesting journey. And um, I'm you know looking forward to being able to share with more. And and at, right at this point in time, we're in the middle of. Um, engaging with um, the PBCs, um, but you know we still got time to go around um, engaging and enabling and um, providing spoken word into this space, which I think is really important. Yeah. Um, can, can I just say, Shona, quickly the other thing that we hope that we are doing the, the groundwork, and then uh, and then different communities can see how it's working and it can take on a life of its own, like being guided by you know the communities take charge of their area on the map that's that's the plan that will have a long long life not this just short life of the of the project so owned by the community not necessarily by a university yeah yeah, yeah. wonderful yeah. thanks sky can i just um ask a question you know, i've gone off script sorry guys um and i tend to do that here sally's laughing goes she did say to me before shani why do you send us these things because you never stick to it um you know i get um asked the question um all the time around you know you know what like we've got truth can we just like can't we just tell it can't we just get it over with and go open slather can't we just do it on our own can you just talk me through some of the um the reasons why we can't do that uh, or the risks associated with just an open slather truth telling process like that's not structured you know i, I take your point alex um you know un, you know unfettered truth there's there's you know whose truth and how is that told can, can we just go into that a little bit? Because I'm constantly bombarded with, well, we'll just do our own truth process and we'll make sure we promise that First Nations people are there. I really want to delve into that one because I think that's an important piece. Who wants to take that one on? I'll go first. Thanks. <laughs> um, I think the problem with that is, again, it comes back to, you know, for me, I'm always asked to consult on something. Oh, can you be a part of a consultation process? We're doing this. Can we, you know, and it's like, also you got to remember, like in all of those circumstances where you're constantly asking Aboriginal people to dredge up horrible histories, you know, like Keenan said, there's a trauma based around that. And you can't just say, well, let's open this wound. Oh no, let's open that wound again. Oh, no, 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 let's open that again. Because while for you, when you're going and asking these people to tell you their truths, it might be the first time you're asking, but it might be the 10th, the 20th time for that person or for that family group or for that nation that you're asking that. And so it has to go through a process where it's done and it has to be led by communities. You know, it has to be led from us to say, this is our voice. We've written it down. We've recorded it. Let's work in our true meaningful partnerships to get it out there. And, you know, this comes back into allyship, you know, where how allies can be best um, utilised, you know, because a lot of people who work with First Nations groups around, you know, my dad was married in, he was non-Indigenous. And so, you know, there's a lot of people that work with mob who become family, you know, who, who you know, but who are so immersed, but they actually forget that they have a privilege. You know, you're constantly hearing this knowledge. So how are you gonna use your privilege to share it? And, you know, with the Uluru Statement, we were asking everyone to walk beside us. You know, it was, yes, to the government, but it was gifted to the Australian people. So this is what we're asking for. And we're asking you to walk beside us, not in front of us, because that's been happening now for 200 plus years, walk beside us and walk behind us sometimes. So in these things of narrative of like, just tell, let's just open it up. It's also, let's be really clear, there is mob who have different relationships to first contact, to 
um, frontier situations. There's also like, you know, Top End, Arnhem, Men Like Mob, you know, they've got different relationships as well. You know, Torres Strait Islander with Papua New Guinea to Indonesia. So all of those things, there's elements of truth telling that is very different and some are very beautiful and not in a lot of trauma based. So there's other ways that we can do it and we need to be leading it. And I think, you know, Shona, you and I have had lots of discussions about how lots of people want to just slather the truth element um, on their reconciliation action plans. And it's, that goes to saying, well, hang on, you can't pick and choose. You've been doing that for 200 years now. We've said to you, this is what we want. And in all of those elements of asking mob to give the truth, are you actually working with any First Nations people alongside you to make sure they're leading that conversation? So I think that's where we have to continue to come back to is like, where is the voice in that? You know, and it's and you've got to remember your first time asking might not be the first time they've been asked. And it might not be the first time they're telling the story. Hmm. Thank you, Sally. I'm just thinking, is anyone else? Yeah, um, I, can I add to that? Just a very absolutely. quick comment on that. Um, yeah, look, I, I mean, I would hope very much that any truth telling process is developed from the grassroots for, and it absolutely, you know, comes from there. But the danger of having it outside of, completely outside of government is that it can then be marginalised as an official sort of process. So I think you, you do want it to be, you don't want government running it, we certainly don't want that, but we do we do want government at least acknowledging it as an official thing, because that if that doesn't happen, then it's too convenient to go. Oh, we'll we'll, we'll just push it to one side. I mean, it, it, I'm reminded of the bringing them home report. You know, there's this Human Rights Commission has this incredible process. New knowledge, shocking knowledge comes out about what had happened to people through that, and then it's presented to government, and government just doesn't even release it. They just sort of push it to a side and that that phenomenal truth telling process where people had exposed themselves and told such traumatizing stories doesn't even get to be officially recognized for a long time and then it gets twisted and so you can't ignore the, the sort of the official government role in it I think that's why it's important to have the voice still there even though of course it should be a grassroots sort of process. Yes. Um, absolutely. That kind of resonates with the Uluru Statement, just a fraction um, around, you know, this most intensive, you know, regional community information gathering project done in history. And um, we once again, you know, it was done and it was gifted and, and pushed to the side, just a fraction um, and, and diluted with other things. So it's quite, you know, it's quite, it seems to be um, the status quo when, when community's voice is sought and, and gathered. Can I just ask a question, and I don't know who, which one of you want to, wants to have this one. Um, there's been, and Akina, you did allude to it before, um, there has been truth-telling um, truth exercises, commissions, a whole bunch of things that have happened in other places with First Nations peoples um, abroad. I, you know, can we, you know, how is that done and um, what's come of that? Does anyone have the content knowledge around that? Because I think it can be done uh, and it has been done. And, and let's have a Let's have a bit of a um, you know chat about that. Who wants to go there? Keenan, you talked about before. Did you want to lead off? Um, yeah, I don't know a whole lot. I know Germany also went through a, a mm. training process after um, Nazi Germany, um, and they've got a whole bunch of, bunch of laws. I'm pretty sure that kind of um, restrict um, anti um, Holocaust. Um, it's like you can cut mm -hmm. them up, stuff like that. I, where kind of in Australia you look at it, people still deny genocide. They um, some people think it was a good thing that the English um, colonized Australia and not um, what is it, the Chinese or you know, other nations, as if it kind of gives um, colonization some kind of um, I don't know little feel good moment, you know. <laughs> um, I don't know what else to add. Um, maybe it's some of the historians will probably have a better understanding in terms of truth telling processes and what's come out of that. Um, internationally. Guy, I think you're on mute. Sorry. Yeah, there we go. Sorry. Um, I was just going to say, I know, uh, yeah, as well as Germany, you know, in South Africa, they had, I think it was the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. 
Yep. Uh, and in South American states, they've had um, truth telling commissions as well to come to terms with um, military dictatorships and the killings of people with military dictatorships, which isn't directly, you know, not specifically in Indigenous people. Um, but I think it's just nations have to come to terms with their pasts and and sometimes these commissions, that's the way that people uh, get to give their stories in a safe, respectful environment that will might, you know, create major changes in legal um, processes and things as well. That So they certainly, certainly serve a point, you know, I think there's definitely a need for a um, state sponsored truth telling um, structure or, you know, an environment, I think, for for the wider, you know, for it to be widely heard and um, accepted as 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 fact or, you know, as verifiable and as, yeah. Um, yeah. So like a macarata, add, like a macarata maybe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah but unfortunately, like, uh, I'll just be the thing in the little <laughs> bonnet is, um, I don't think Australia is ready for that yet. I don't think we are comfortable with our First Nations history. I don't think we're comfortable talking about what has happened in our country. And I think that's the, unfortunately, I don't, I can't see a Truth and Reconciliation Commission done like that. You know, I know that Canada also had one, South Africa, and that, you know, and that's all of those horrific things had happened in living memory as well. You know, for us, we're still denying our conversations around, you know, a stolen generation that, you know, and people are like, oh, just get over it already. And it's like, are you kidding me? That was only my grandmother or, you know, like that. that is literally, and we're told to move on from that now. So I, I don't even think people are willing to have that conversation just yet. But I think the way we are moving and I think the way that we are dealing with different elements of that, it has been so beautiful how we're starting to call out more and more the social, you know, the casual racism that we see, you know, all of that sort of stuff. It's we are moving towards a better a better system and a better way of t treating each other. But I don't know if we're in that process to have a truth and reconciliation commission. Yeah, yeah, that's maybe, just my opinion. Yeah, yeah, maybe not yet, but you know, moving, yeah. moving in the direction. Yeah, okay. yeah. So I don't know, um, Alex. I don't know if you want to come off mute if you ever want me to. <laughs> yeah, okay. You know, I, that's, I, that's a clue. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just say, look, I completely agree with Sally on that. I think it's uh, we're not there, and that's why first step one, get a voice. <laughs> step two, you know, with that, then you can start making those conversations more official, pushing people to where we need to get to. If you look at South Africa, I mean, they've been already, uh, um, they'd, they'd had a democratic movement, a new government's come in place. It's that new government that sets up the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. There's a lot of power there among the victims being able to set it up. And then those, you know, those who didn't want to have a Truth and Recon Reconciliation Commission were able to be drawn to the table and go, we need you to hear this. But Australia is so far away from that at the moment. There's still such a level of denial around that, that just the whole process of colonisation. We haven't even, as um, Keenan said before, you know, the history wars, we, we haven't even overcome that. So, yeah. there's, so there's a long way to go before we can have a, a, genuine, um, a genuine conversation. And I think that projects like Skies are so important for that, that we, we just keep slowly chipping away at, at getting these stories out there so that and hopefully there is this sort of change in attitude at a societal level slowly but surely but um, Sally you're dead right I mean we're, we're just not there yet for that yeah so is that then a bit of a, a truth moment for Australia in the current context I'm not talking about um, you know our, our colonial settling space I'm um, talking about the truth of our relationship now and is there is there work we can do now, not necessarily, um, you know, in, in, you know, the, the intended conversation that the Uluru talked about, but certainly around the truth in our current relationship and our current connection and our current willingness to engage in conversations and, and enabling and amplifying First Nations voice? Is, I'm going to throw that one out there. Are we ready for that piece of truth around where we are now and, and what we're about? 
Mm. Yeah, that's a really good question. Can I, sorry, I've jumped in a bit too early here. You're just very quickly. It seems, um, for me, the whole voice movement is about truth, isn't it? Because it's, it's making us confront how our system of government has marginalised Aboriginal people for so long. That is a, that is a reckoning with truth. And, and it's really interesting, interesting to see how there is this pushback from even acknowledging that uh, in, in, in the voice movement. Um, I mean, I must say, uh, this might be a bit controversial, but I'm a big fan for it. let's go for it, let's have a referendum and let's see where Australia really sits on this. I, I just think, um, you know, there's risk involved in that, but I just think have a referendum, tell the story, persuade people. You know, persuade people that this is the right thing to do. If we're too scared to have a referendum and, oh, no, then I just fear that we'll just be going on and on and on forever. So we, we just got to go for it. And I think Alex is right on the money there. There is, you know, we've looked, so all the work that the um, Uluru Statement team have been doing, you know, looking at the um, all of the submissions into the NIAA, so the Marty Langton, Tom Karma. Uh, you know, their submissions and reports and the consultation as it was, as you know, I'm not going to go into it and shade too much into that. Um, you know, looking at all of that and seeing, you know, how many times people are saying they support a constitutionally enshrined voice, and that is the key, a constitutionally enshrined voice. You know, unfortunately, Labor and Liberals, so, you know, Labor's on Liberals' bandwagon here is saying that they want to legislate it first. Um, if it gets legislated, we know that that can be dropped, uh, you know, any time by government. That's why we're wanting it on um, constitutionally enshrined. And, you know, it's, it is, the Australian people want it. There's something like an um, 80, between 85 to 93% say yes to it. But I really think it's government who's, who were so scared to do that and they've lost their backbone into actually going for it why are they scared sally uh, i was gonna say, <laughs> look i honestly look if we because aboriginal people already get the blame already get the blame for systems not working you know uh you know the closing the gap schemes all of that we get the blame for it not working out and you know let's be honest all of those all of those targets all of those um processes are all start done in Canberra you know all of these programs are all done in Canberra where we don't have a say in it and it's also very stock standard what will work for Ghana mob will work for Google the mob will work for API mob will work for TI mob like all of that um and so what we need to go is like well hang on we need to be at the front we need to be able to say well actually it doesn't work like that mob but different mob have different ways to working and I honestly think if government don't do that, the, the dead cat on the table, which is Aboriginal affairs, they like to whack it out whenever they're having their own internal issues, um, won't be there anymore. You know, if we started to really lean in and have our own say in turn things around, which is what we're hoping to do, it will seriously won't, it will not be the trigger point that it is, you know, but unfortunately, First Nations issues, Aboriginal affairs constantly becomes, you know, it's put on there as a distraction for media. It's also put there to kick it down the road and say, oh, sorry, it's not working out. You know, it's great, you know, it's great to blame us for something when things aren't going right. You know, let's look at the COVID response, you know. Aboriginal yeah. people weren't even thought about in the responses you know we were maybe fourth fifth down the rank you know it was about the business community first it was about you know the finances about making sure all of that was right you know I was in the position of chair of APY council when we when we started to have the conversations around COVID back in February last year you know and so we put in restrictions back then you know and the government didn't move on any restrictions I don't think until end of March you know, but you look at how Aboriginal communities responded with COVID. They locked mm. out people they wanted to protect. They made it very, you know, they asked people not to come into their communities. They, you know, also the Aboriginal controlled organisations and health services have had the vaccine and have, you know, have got communities vaccinated. 
and the government controlled ones haven't. So it really goes to show when we're at the front leading it, we can do much better. And that's my very cynical view in why the government doesn't want us to be at the front. But I just, I don't know. I think it's a scared factor as well, you know? They've been able to keep us down and it serves a purpose. That's okay. Sorry, so I just got, made it. You're the <laughs> Debbie Downer today. Thanks, Sally. Right. <laughs> but that's your lived experience. Really not the so, Debbie you know, Downer. That's the experience, um, you know, you know, in terms of, um, you know, and, and, you know, why I hear the message coming through loud and clear was around, you know, that constitutional change enables that, you know, consistent, measured, um, you know, true voice of community to come through so they can actively influence um, those with power. And for a very long time, First Nations people have been without the opportunity, um, being without power. And, you know, that doesn't necessarily um, enable our full participation. You know, you have a look at the stats anyway. I'm going to do my rant. Is that all right, Sally? You know? <laughs> We know our stats, um, you know, around our rep over representation in in um, you know areas of you know inequity in in Australia, and I think I think you said it before, and I wanted to get into that conversation around flipping the narrative in First Nation world around. Um, I think and anyone who knows me does, knows that I go on this rant a lot around, um, you know, we always talk about Aboriginal issues or First Nation issues, but rarely do we talk about First Nations interests. Now we can have those conversations in the same kind, what, what are our interests um, in, in, this, in the voice conversation? What's our interest in our engagement in, in housing, in health? You know, if we talk about Aboriginal issues in housing or Aboriginal issues in health, it's a very different conversation than if we have a conversation about what are our interests in that? And I think for me, when I read the Uluru Statement um, and hear the conversations that I've heard over the many years that I've been involved in this space is, you know, that's really what we're asking for, a participation in a conversation, not even asking, we have a right to conversations um, about our interests in all aspects of Australian life and all aspects of life, um, which is a full entitlement. And um, for us, I think that's what I love doing these webinars for, is we get to explore some of these things that we don't normally get to explore. Um, but one of the things I know being in the reconciliation movement is I've got people probably on the webinar um, and feel free to, you know, on your chat go, yes, that's me, <laughs> uh, on the webinar going, well, what on earth can this little, you know, rabbit do, this little soul do um, on the end of the webinar to enable this? What is my gig in the bigger system thing? Because all Uluru, people think about it as a federal thing, but it's, it, it, yes, there's a big federal umbrella that sits above that, but that, the elements ring true for your everyday interactions in your workplace, in your sporting environment, in your school environment. What can people on the other end watching you today, what can they do when they walk away from this um, and be an active, positive contributor to that gracious invitation that was issued on May in 2017? Who wants to go first? Um, can I start by saying something first? Oh, of course. Sorry, Ken. And always. <laughs> You're all good. Um, so, yesterday I participated in a panel for in International Indigenous World People Day. And I was joined by other First Nations people from around, um, from different countries. It was really good to kind of get some feedback and get bounce off each other. Um, and we got to the point where we're talking about um, kind of what is success for First Nations peoples and what are our interests. And often the metrics for success in the world that we live in, in today are from a Western land. So it's like, are you educated? Did you go to high school, university? Do you have a job? Do you own your house? All this kind of stuff like that. And often those are interests that, like, sure, there are all like, people that are interested in getting further education and owning a house stuff like that. But then there are some of us from, from our communities that are in a position to actually even afford to buy a house, let alone rent properties and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Um, so it's like, where are the metrics for this success that are um, dictated from us as a community in terms of being strong in language, culture, connection to the country, being able to go back on country and stuff like that and, and educated in our own histories? And I think it feed, this feeds into the Uluru statement, especially around like voice and truth and stuff like that, is that the metrics for success at the moment isn't for us, it's for us to participate in the Western world. And I think what you're talking about about interest as well, that my interest is, well, I want to be more knowledgeable with back home in terms of what's happening in my community and my culture and stuff like that as well. I think that's also builds into like building us, building us up as strong Aboriginal people. But <laughs> top of the air, sorry. No, that's all right. I think that was a really important thing. And it was yesterday. How awesome, sorry, 
sidebar how awesome was it for you to be on a call with like people from all over the world and talk about the things you're most passionate about well, how was that it was deadly because like you kind of like because I, I spoke with mob from like communities that i hadn't even heard of like tuvalu and there was like a few islands like Alor, which is in indonesia but to listen to the stories and kind of listen to like how their communities operate and you see so much of the similarities in terms of like connectedness connection to the country um but also this issues around, but like, there are issues that we don't necessarily experience in terms of like both in Pacific islands and nations where they have climate change is one of the real big emerging issues, you know, like they're gonna lose their islands potentially. But it was kind of good to feel that energy as well and to feed off one another and kind of like, even though we live miles apart, the fact that we are so similar and have so much similarities in our cultures was like, was, like deadly for me. No, and that's, um, you know, another part of allyship as well in that space around how, how can we ally to each other? Um, because we're not one homogenous group either um, across Australia. We're very different. Very, 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 very different. Um, Sally or, or Alex or, or Sky, allyship, you know, I'm really keen. I know we've got 10 minutes left and I've got a big spiel about allyship later. Um, so I'll take my two minutes then. But is there anything, you know, from your world in terms of, you know, the roles you've played. I know, you know, Sally, you've got, you know, a whole bunch, you know, of ideas and things around what people can do in this space. And Alex, you know, your work um, in Native Title and being a part of this journey and, and using your, you know, your knowledge and skills in that space um, and supporting the national movement, how have you shown your allyship um, in Australia um, for the Uluru Statement? And, and, you know, how have you done that? And I'm keen, people are really keen to see how you got yourself involved in all of this. Mm. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I mean, the involvement for me was, it's probably started out as academic, really, like I'm going, wow, this is great. I mean, I have a, a general sort of, have been a supporter of uh, a number of issues over the years. But when I saw this, this is such a good idea. Um, and so my way of then participating was to try and organise a few sort of seminars and lectures where people got um, different um people in to speak about the Uluru Statement and to talk about the what I think is such a clear and simple message that it that it sells like that that's the other thing it sells itself the Uluru Statement I mean it is just so poetic and that what is being asked for is so honest and truthful um, and vulnerable you know and it's it's not what, what I loved about it is the statement doesn't go in there going, you've got to give us this because, you know, it's not angry. There's not any anger where you deserve to be angry, but the anger isn't there. And it's, and it's so, I think the main way to be an ally is to just go, here it is. Here it is, everyone. Read it. Read it. Understand what it's asking for. And just one comment on the, the idea of the legislation. So, Shani, you said, what's the government scared of? Sadly, I'm a bit cynical on this. I don't think they're scared. I think they're using the legislative voice as a way of just creating noise and complicating things and making a false debate because there should be no debate about that. What's been asked for is a constitutional voice. I just think the response to that is to not even engage with them and go, well, we just want a constitutional voice. I don't care what you're saying. Like, <laughs> like this, is, this is what's been asked for. If, if no Aboriginal people engage in the legislative voice process, then it ha can't have any legitimacy. So it just seems like it then it just has to fail. And so I think keeping a, a clear eye on the goal um, and allies, so people like me, trying to assist with, well, how can we get involved to, to keep that clear eye on the goal? of the referendum. Thanks, Alex. So if you can come be my campaign manager here at Reconciliation SA, so keep the eye on the prize. Um, thank you. Um, Sky, have you got any last thoughts around allyship and, and playing, you know, how you play your part or, or advice for others in, in, in this space? Yeah, I'm just thinking, um, you know, we haven't really considered it yet, but we need to wait with you, Shona, about how we can best through this project promote the Uluru Statement and the idea of Makarata. That it's, it's the idea of truth telling is fundamental to the project, but we, we haven't really, you know, considered that. But that would be definitely something that we can include in the, the final stage of our project is is sort of getting communities to come together about how they are going to maybe um, memorialise particular events or um, commemorate or um, whatever. So that that would be a you know good good component of yep. um, 
definitely working with you. But I was just going to quickly say about that that one part of our project is the educative part of it as well. And um, Sally, I definitely heard what you were saying about having Aboriginal people there writing the curriculum. And that is one we haven't got to that stage yet, but we definitely know that this this map is going to be a website, a map and things um, that will be a very useful tool for teachers. So that's, you know, we, we definitely need to get um, get on board with a, a wide range of educators, including um, Aboriginal people to to work on the best way to do that as well. Yep. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, I'm going to get on my train, all right, because <laughs> I don't, I don't get to do. I'm always moderating, and you watch all the participant numbers are going to fall out now because Shana's on hers. But um, you know, one of the things, um, you know, we've done a series of webinars. Chuck in, guys, and if you want, just take yourself off mute, and I'll throw to you. But we've done a series of webinars now. You know, we, we've explored voice, we've explored treaty, and we've explored truth, and we've had um, participants from across the country come on board. Participants. That you've never seen or heard of before you've learned about new projects that are happening here right here in south australia you know that um believe it or not adelaide uni uh, it blew me away how involved um adelaide uni are in this but i could just you know i'm thinking wow that's amazing i might talk to flinders and and um, uni sa and see what they're doing but um i've been you know there's people i've not met before or heard of before that have been involved in this space and using their knowledge and their skills and i think um you know one of the things i can recommend to people to take away from these webinars is that um, the movement is still strong. Stay true to Uluru, it's still there. Uh, we are still advocating and pushing for this. This is something that hasn't gone away and nor will it go away. You have tools available to you. You have these webinars, they're all saved um, on our YouTube channel at Reconciliation SA. It's also on our um, website, access to these videos. Um, I've been too busy trying to talk and moderate and make sure I don't stuff it up, but I haven't actually put it in the chat bar, but I will email each of you with a, a link to that. Um, you know, there is a great um, a wealth of resources. Um, most importantly, um, uh, the team in Sydney, um, New South Wales, I believe, has set up a, um, if you go to their website, um, Uluru Statement, um, they have a really great opportunity for you to do something today, which is email or send a message to your local MP around the importance of um, a constitutionally enshrined voice. Um, there are points of reference. We're not asking, you know, in there, there's an opportunity for you to personally craft an email to your local member. You simply put in your postcode and it flies off to your federal member. Um, I'd love you to hashtag and share, um, share some really important information around the Uluru Statement. Um, on Facebook, like um, the Uluru Statement from the Heart um, Facebook group. Um, there's also another one called From the Heart. Share the information, hashtag stay true to Uluru or hashtag it's time or hashtag Uluru Statement. Whatever you want, those hashtags are really, really important. Um, Sally's just put some stuff up around writing to your um, local member. So click on that. You can do that. Send that around to your workplace. Hold like, you know, Alex has done, you know, share the videos at, at a staff meeting. Introduce this concept to people. We'll be looking to do other things at Reconciliation SA over the next little while and how we can manage that. Um, and, and look for ways to engage you. We'll keep you in the loop. We have a newsletter that we run stuff around all the restatement every month in. So subscribe to Reconciliation SA's newsletter and we'll put it in there. Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff that goes on that you can access and be a part of. Um, we will um, be putting up uh, information about all our guest appearances so you know who was talking um, and what they're on about and how you can contact them if you want more information. But, um, you know, it is a really exciting time uh, for us to push um, the NIAA um, co-design piece is about to be released to the public. I understand it's gone up to cabinet and it's about to be released public. So we will see what the government's interpretation of a voice is um, and how they like to go about it. And I'm sure you're going to hear more from us when that drops around what we think of it. I haven't seen it, so I don't know. Um, but, it, you know, the time has come um, and we're really excited about what could be around the corner if we just embrace um, what's there. Sally, I know you took yourself off mute. I know that's time for me to be quiet. So what is <laughs> I didn't even realize I'd done that. Uh, no, I think it's thank you, Jonah, for all these webinars and everything and everyone on the panel. I think, you know, the key thing is that it's about a people's power. You know, it's time for us to move um, the agenda and it's time for First Nations people to be truly um, seen in this country. And but it takes everyone working together to do that. Um, 
unfortunately we are a small percentage of the Australian po population. So it is very much writing to your MPs, letting them know that you support an enshrined um, voice in the Australian constitution, make sure that's very clear. Um, as Shona said, you know, definitely do the it's time, um, stay true to Uluru as your, if you've got anyone on social medias. Also let, um, you know, we've got a volunteers, um, you know, list happening with, um, so if you want to volunteer for any events we've got coming up or anything like that, um, go on the Reconciliation SA um, website, do a volunteers and just say that you want to be part of the Uluru Statement stuff. Um, but thank you so much. And it's about, you know, or even if you want to engage, I'm, I'm working with the Uluru Statement with the national team, but also with the South Australian team. So if there's any way that you think that we can come into your workplaces and talk to and have those conversations, because it's about getting the voices out, you know, and it's about everyone coming on this journey together. So let us know if you also would like me to come and have a chat um, or anyone, I think. <laughs> I think anyone. Um, but thank you so much. And thanks for coming on on a um, Tuesday mid-morning. Tuesday mid-morning. Wonderful time slot. Thank you so much, everybody. I've really enjoyed thank it. You. Thanks to you online. Um, it's been a wonderful time and, and we'll be in touch shortly. Thank you. Thanks. thanks. Bye. Bye.